Great, thank you. Um, hi everyone, I'm Pamela. Um, welcome to this uh, production of Hamilton on Disney Plus. Today we'll be talking about, that was the laugh line that no one got. Um, today we'll be talking about adversarial attacks uh, on NLP models. Um, so a lot of my work in the program has been about critically thinking about how we motivate this work. Um, and this talk will mostly be a commentary and analysis about the sort of state of the literature on adversarial attacks in NLP. Um, so as some background, the image space has robust literature on using targeted manipulations and model interpretability to understand things like adversarial attacks, con controllable generation, and intersectional bias. There's, push, there's also push from policymakers to understand how models work and what failure states exist. Models exist in the wild. Uh, we're beholden to their bias um, and their failure states every day. Uh, and so I sort of wanted to strengthen sort of my understanding of how we quantify those failure states. Um, so a lot of this work is motivated from a 2019 paper from Allen AI, led by a team um, with Eric Wallace, uh, where they define what they call universal adversarial trigger, which um, is a short phrase that can cause a specific model prediction when concatenated to any input from a data set. And the yeah, paper demonstrates- Can you refresh your slides so that we get the most updated ones? It seems to be stuck. Stopped. Does that? There, there we go. OK. Um, well, if you're trying. So the paper demonstrates the triggers transfer between models. They're both model agnostic and input agnostic. Um, what does this look like? So let's say we have a sentiment classifier. Can you see the diagram? Yeah. OK, great. Um, so let's say we have a sentiment classifier. Um, given the input, the movie was awful, we'd expect it to classify that as negative. Um, but a trigger would look like something like, and this is a trigger we found when we uh, ran this, found you were invigorating, captivating. Um, so that appended to the movie was awful, would flip the result of the classifier from negative to positive. It seems like we're still having a little bit of trouble with your slides or showing a blank. Um, it takes a little bit show now you're finally now i'm fine okay um it, can you see them now still okay i might have to do you might have to see my whole browser i guess is the punchline does that is that okay yeah That's try going to the next slide um and if it doesn't refresh really quickly we might move your slides for you okay um so uh, so this would flip the output from negative to positive. And they sort of clear why this is a failure in the case of a classifier, right? Where you know what the output should be. This is not, this is changing the output to the wrong answer. Um, in a language model, it's a bit less clear. So what a language model does is given an input like the movie was, we'd expect it to complete that text in a way that makes sense given the context. So the movie was a great film. Be a okay response from a language model. Um, what a trigger would do here um, is um, when we append some tokens, rap, you know, fun, basketball, football, all sports words to the movie was, the language model would instead complete that with text about sports. Um, and it's kind of less clear whether we should consider this a failure. Um, this trigger in particular, prepended or appended to the input, may not be content preserving on this input. This many words about sports might change the meaning or intent of the original input. As another example, adding a six token string to the end of any Shakespeare play shouldn't result in hate speech, even if the play is The Merchant of Venice. So we want to sort of understand how stealthy we need to make these triggers to make the results of the language model qualify as a failure. Um, and that question is clearer in other spaces like audio or vision, where we can use whether a trigger is perceptible or imperceptible by humans as a guide. We don't have a tool to easily assess imperceptibility for language. Um, but one thing we may want to try is making triggers stealthier. So both as short as possible and constrained to language that makes semantic or natural sense. If I saw this trigger in the wild, I'd say something's up. You don't just throw a bunch of sports words together. Um, whereas, um, well, it's difficult. So where it's, it's difficult to say whether the behavior in this slide should be considered a mistake or not. Something like this, where you just append cats to the movie was and the language model spits out dogs, we could probably say 
is wrong. Um, so how do we find these triggers? Great question. Um, so we can't apply the techniques developed in the vision space directly to this problem. For one, language is discrete, whereas images can be continuous. Um, as a way of seeing that, think about a rainbow it goes from red to orange to yellow. We touch every color in between. Um, we don't have the language to describe all of those colors in between. So we approximate. This is the hot flip attack, and this uh, slide is, which you can hopefully all see, um, is taken from the original paper. Um, so we come up with a neutral trigger, in this case, the, 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 and we'll append that to a batch of examples. Um, we then backprop on the gradient, maximizing the likelihood of the class we're trying to flip to. So here you see a bunch of positive examples about film, and we're trying to flip those to negative. Um, and we do this for some number of iterations. We go from the, 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 to movie Apollo spider, to zoning tapping fiends in the end. Um, uh, so we do it for some number of iterations or until we don't see any changes in the loss. Um, and just to note in the language model case, our loss might maximize, for example, the likelihood of the target outputs we're trying to um, find a trigger for. So when conditioned on any user input, we should reach those target outputs. And um, using this, we replicated the results in the original paper across a number of tasks. So sentiment analysis, natural language inference, squad, and GBD2 attacks. On these tasks, we see that accuracy drops close to zero. Um, and you can see also that we, when we allow the trigger length to increase, uh, the, the attack becomes more potent. So the less stealthy the trigger, the better it is at doing this. Um, interestingly, the um, result on the right is with random attacks rather than hot flip, and it also works pretty well. So it's unclear whether we need to do all of this maximizing across the feature space. Great, so why would we want an attack like this? That's a good question. Um, I think this is um, where my work um, deviates from Wallace's a bit. The motives for, for an adversary to engage in this kind of attack are weak. The clearest use of a universal trigger is that we may not have access to the target model or the particular input at runtime. Because universal attacks do not require white box access and work on any input, they can be easily distributed even without technical knowledge, but it's still kind of unclear how you'd use them. So, for example, the threat model is posed by a very deliberate and unlikely attack. You come up with the universal adversarial trigger, you hack into a GPT-2 server, you append the trigger to all inputs coming over the server, and you kind of watch and wreak havoc. But if your real goal is to wreak havoc, you could also just write some hate speech and post it online, which is far easier and requires far less technical know-how. Um, and if we look at how G adversaries use GPT-2 in, in the model, in the wild, not that many people were really engaging in attacks like this. Um, just as one example, if you search for GPT-2 on YouTube, some of the first results are people being like, how do I use this to boost my channel? Um, but with largely neutral comments, not with how do I attack someone else's channel with hate comments. Um, so as another uh, motivation, we can sort of think about triggers as examples of failure states of our model. So we've approached, if not reached, human level accuracy on a number of tasks, returning to the sentiment analysis we were talking about before. Here you see that we're approaching 100% um, accuracy on SST2. Um, but a few questions remain. In this like 3% that we're missing, what are we missing? How robust are these models? Um, and what has the model really learned and how generalizable, generalizable is it? So to dig in on the first question, how robust are models? Um, in real life, language undergoes perturbations all the time. Uh, you might say to your friend, wow, that movie was so good. And they might miss the sarcasm and text someone saying, she said the movie was really good. And the classifier will then uh, say that that was a positive review. Um, but these deviations could take multiple forms. They can be adversarial triggers. They could be random noise, a typo. They could be structured nuance. Tone is an example. Um, sarcasm, obfuscation hedging a lot of questions um, along the way, or sort of data set bias. And second question, how generalizable are models? How prone are they to memorization? Um, we know that LMs learn from many potential data sources, um, but model design also influences how likely they are to generalize from that data or memorize that data. So we see in low resource languages on Google Translate, um, given kind of nonsense triggers, the language model will evolve into sort of satanic verses from the Bible. Um, and this can be weird when it comes to Bible verses, 
but also creepy when it means memorized personal data as the team from Berkeley showed. Um, so we want to sort of like see um, triggers as examples or ways to sort of get at answering these questions. Um, so I tried to do that. Um, first, I looked at the stealthiness question of just like how good can we make the trigger given this threat model and how um, and what happens when we try and do that. So we were able to replicate the results of the original paper. We decreased accuracy on classification ta ta tasks and random attacks tended to work as well. Um, when we tried to force the triggers to be more stealthy by sampling directly from GPT-2, instead of using hot flip, the results were less promising. So I don't want to say like definitively that there don't exist stealthy triggers that will flip SSD2, for example, but we weren't able to find them in the few techniques we tried. Um, as another one, we sort of looked at these results in the paper that were forcing triggers to get GPT-2 to devolve into um, generating hate speech. Um, in our experiments, coming up with triggers to generate hate speech wound up with triggers that were largely hate speech in and of themselves. Um, notably, these triggers transferred to GPT-3 as well. We saw that in around 20% of cases, they also created hate speech on GPT-3. Um, and they also regularly highlight particular people. So I'm not going to show examples of hate speech right now, um, but in a lot of the racism triggers, we saw the word Coulter, presumably referring to Ann Coulter. We saw Hannity, presumably referring to Sean Hannity. Um, and so while these are public figures and we don't necessarily need to be con um, concerned about that being private information about them, it is interesting to note the sort of aspects of those particular people that GPT-2 has learned in some respect. Um, we also saw the hate speech triggers targeted at a particular protected class produced outputs against other classes as well. So racism and sexism triggers on GPT-3 produced ableist and homophobic text. Um, so yeah, we also um, were con uh, considered how they applied to charge but slightly less polarizing text. So we showed that triggers exist for other topics. We looked at vaccines and Brexit, um, though our evaluation suggested that they're slightly less potent. So here are two of the triggers we found for vaccinations. Um, and we appended them to we just uh, generate on their own. Um, we used the first seven lines of the Merchant of Venice and the first line of the Merchant of Venice, prepended and appended to the trigger. Um, and here are some of the results. So you can see that the first one, it has to do with vaccines, which is expected, um, but it in and of itself is not anti-vax, whereas all of the text in the target text was anti-vax. Um, the second appended to the Merchant of Venice, you sort of lose the meaning of the trigger altogether. Um, we see that this is not Shakespearean language, but is a GPT-2 approximation of it. Um, but appended to just one line, we do sort of still see a mixing of the two. So this isn't the best example, but um, we saw a lot of examples of kind of Shakespearean talk about sickness or illness or the things you'd expect vaccines to be associated with. So whereas a racism trigger would always produce racist content, an anti-vax trigger won't always produce anti-vax. Um, content. So in conclusion, um, targeted perturbations are a rich area in the image space and have been used to create generative models and as interpretability tools there. Um, to apply this language, this method to language, we need clear normative goals for LMs and NLP systems. Um, we did show that models are still brittle, even some of the best triggers transferred to GPT-3. Um, and more study of the triggers we find would be an interesting direction to take this. So why do they behave in this way? And what do they tell us about how models learn in general? And there's one way, one direction we might take this. Um, for GPT-3 and few shot learning, you're given a task description and a number of examples. Um, but the task description is written by humans with an idea of how they would um, frame that task. We can instead consider the task description as a trigger and backprop on these examples to find, to sort of maximize the likelihood that um, the model will be able to perform this task. Um, so anyway, thanks everyone, uh, particularly to my mentor, Alec, who I'm sure is, uh, did not want me to thank him basically, and uh, my fellow scholars who were great, and Christina Mariah and everyone I chatted with on Slack throughout the day. It's a really fun program, so Q&A time.
is there a way to represent language as continuous? Um, I mean, we sort of cast language into a continuous space um, using word vectors, but it's, uh, and we can sort of see continuous like aspects learned of that language. So for example, we take one of these vectors for king minus queen and we might get man minus woman um, as uh, representing the same thing, but that's all an approximation, so. If you think of a language model as a sentiment protector, could an attacker be motivated by changing the sentiment? Um, I think they could. It's just, again, like if you were to hack into a system and append this trigger to any task, by the time you're in a system doing that, you could just force the output you want. Um, I don't know why it's lower. I have a sense of why it worked, which is we were using a very brittle classifier, just like a simple LSTM. Um, sorry, I guess I should read the questions. Why do you think the rate at which the accuracy drops off in terms of the trigger length is lower for random than non-random triggers? Um, I don't have a sense of why it's lower. I, I think um, it, it works because we were using a pretty brittle classifier. Um, um, tagging sentiment on pretty short sentences anyway, so the like the classifier is just getting distracted by the additional words, regardless of what those words are. Um, seem to be uncommon or even nonsensical phrases. On the inputs of a means of trigger or out of distribution detection, I think that's definitely um, a reasonable question. Um, I think that's why, that's all another reason I think it's interesting to frame this work as these triggers aren't going to be seen in the wild. No, if you did encounter one in the wild, you'd automatically be able to detect them. I'm wary of anything that sort of like suggests we just build a, detec a detector on top of a model, because if you look at the image space, every defense you come up with for one of these attacks, another attack just emerges in its place. I think we can instead see the full class of Things we consider attacks or defenses and sort of say that actually tells us something interesting about how these models work um, and we can recast the problem in that way. Oh, there's another one. Okay, did you experiment with the granularity of the triggers? Um, did a little. I also tried to do more and it didn't work. Um, so we did, I did um, for the GPT-2 triggers, try and sample directly from GPT-2 to make um, language that didn't feel jarring to encounter in the wild. Um, and they don't work nearly as well. And when they do, it sort of makes sense that they work. Um, we like that's, it's an example of a language model doing what we'd want them to do, what we'd want it to do. Um, 